Okay, so uh, good morning, folks. Um, I'm uh, quite excited to to be with you today to to deliver um, what I think is the the first um, uh, first lecture, which which really uh, satisfactorily uh, explores some issues with this whole class of models known as stylized models. And in the closing minutes of our last session, I uh, alluded to these types of models, um, types of models whose purpose is not to describe a particular external setting or, or be, be quite true in, in many, many particulars to one epidemiological context, but instead the stylized models aim to sharpen our thinking, often to build theory, um, to help us understand the sometimes quite rich collective implications of some very simple assumptions. They help us think, think through how just a few simple rules, for example, come together and give rise to surprising patterns. Uh, now, uh, this issue can be a dry one um, if it's uh, explored in a, uh, in a fashion that um, is more technical than, than application um, oriented. But um, today I'm going to, to try to take some of these principles of, of stylized models and, um, and speak about them in context, several of them new to you. Um, which uh, get into some issues that are traditionally hard to capture in a fully evidenced fashion, in a, in a theory explication fashion. Um, there's many areas where our knowledge scientifically, um, knowledge of the domain is rich enough that we can actually build models that, that plausibly put together a picture of the dominant relevant processes in the world and let us say, let's explicate, let's see the ecological consequences as we put those together for an actual context. But there are some domains, often domains termed as sort of squishy or soft, but which are of profound importance when it comes to issues such as trust, issues such as stigma, uh, issues such as those involving uh, sort of uh, otherization of, of, of other individuals. Um, when, it, when it comes to matters that, that um, relate to sort of broader human psychological tendencies, often we, we lack the detailed theory that would let us build a model for explication. And uh, today, we're going to be looking at ways in which some of these stylized models um, can serve as tools for theory building in these areas um, and allow us to start probing some of these issues, um, these issues uh, which are hard to quantify in a fully pinned down way, but which no doubt have a huge impact on our world. Um, so much of our world revolves around issues like trust, respect, false prey to issues like uh, otherization and stigmatization, uh, false prey to, to uh, people's tendency to, to look down on others um, and not accord them um, reciprocity. Uh, so many of our issues revolve around that. We don't want to be like um, uh, that old story of, of uh, the, in Greek mythology of Procrustes, or just because certain, certain appendages went beyond the end of the bed and were too long for the bed, he cut them off because um, they were inconvenient to deal with. Um, and uh, amputating their legs uh, allowed them to fit on the bed. Um, 
we don't want scientifically to limit our investigations of issues in the world to issues that are convenient to model, that are comfortable to model, that are well characterized enough, we know how to build a model for theory explication. Instead, we build models, in this case, agent-based models, to help us build theory, to, to build up our understanding um, of processes in the world in a more synthetic way. Um, and, and by so doing, we avoid truncating Procrustes' legs. We, we instead um, can allow ourselves to grapple with these concepts, recognizing that we're dealing with a model which is not all pinned down by, by quantitative numbers. But by reasoning about these things, maybe we could move towards operationalizing them in a way that would eventually be more measurable just as researchers over time have, have developed theories involving stress and, and stress responses, uh, involving theories um, that include aspects of fatigue, for example, that are more and more quantifiable. So today we're gonna to be talking about these stylized models. And we're gonna be taking a look at four stylized models. Um, two of them you've already seen, and I'm gonna go quite quickly over those. Uh, shelling segregation model, uh, the, the game of life. But I'm gonna be highlighting some features of them that bear some thinking beyond the, the obvious. But really where I wanna spend more time is talking about models um, that involve some of these concepts uh, uh, that I've just alluded to, which, to which you have not been previously exposed a model involving reciprocity and issues of, um, of competition and, uh, and to a certain degree starting to get into issues of trust, uh, issues of forgiveness uh, with the prisoner's dilemma. We'll then go on to look as time allows at some issues with trust modeling. This is the sphere where I'm pleased to have contributed three agent-based models, um, all of which uh, exhibit really thought-provoking features related to this foundational concept, foundational human emotion of trust. Um, and we'll see how these models capture some basic features, undeniable features as it were of trust and help us think through some consequences of just a few of those features in terms of dynamic behavior. So while this, while this lecture could be viewed at a technical level as about very simple models with stylized rules that are easy to describe on one page, at a deeper level, it's about modeling that can speak to some of these, these issues in the human experience and human theater which we know are so pivotal, so central, so foundational, um, but are, are hard to, uh, to fully pin down and where theory is not so well developed, we can just explicate it. So with that, those comments, I'm going to jump in uh, to some slides, but also we'll be spending a lot of our time running models. So I had noted um, during our previous lectures and, and some during our conceptual, our sort of our, our high level overview of agent-based modeling that we can kind of characterize agent-based models along several axes. And one of the axes that I, I alluded to was between on the one hand theory building models uh, and theory explication models. Again, a distinction uh, Ross Hammond likes to emphasize. And um, today our focus is on these caricature models, these models that are designed to help us sharpen our thinking um, rather than being designed for very particular purposes. Um, and I noted last time that these models fit into this general, general, sort of notion of models as thinking tools or thinking processes, tools that help us think more effectively, much as, much as a crutch helps us achieve 
most of our functionality, despite our physical limitations, when we break a leg, these models, is, this idea of, of computational models as thinking tools, allow us to achieve more complete cognitive functioning despite our, our built-in limitations. They help expand what we can undertake um, cognitively. And stylized models help to simulate those high-level aha moments, those high-level insights. For example, I'll have a simple set of mechanisms killed, can yield unexpected or, 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 or otherwise um, uh, surprising patterns but patterns that might be recognizable from the world. Um, and these models are powerful because they abstract away from the world. And the first model we're gonna open is the shelling segregation model. And again, I'm gonna whiz through this one because we've seen it before. So if you call up your any logics here and you go to help example models. So again, help in any logic and go to example models. I will, make this full screen here by double clicking on this tab. And I'm going to go down to shelling segregation here. And you recall from our past discussions that this is a model where play, people are placed into a square grid. Uh, any one square is occupied by someone who's of, of one of two groups or it's empty. So in this case, it'll be a red group and a black group, and, and then some cells will be empty. And up top here is an indication um, of a choice that we have as modeler. And that choice relates to another key feature of this model, because people are placed initially within this grid, but they can move. Um, so this is a model that unlike the game of life exhibits mobility. And people can move from one cell to the other if, if they are uncomfortable with or, or um, uh, they feel unfulfilled by or they are uh, discomforted by um, the current surrounds. And uh, in this model, the particular thing we're looking at, which may make someone feel discomforted for unfortunate reasons is if other people nearby them don't look like them. So this is a model looking at how preferences involving people's neighbors, who they spend time around, um, shape their behavior. And particularly if they have preferences to live near people like them, say at, at a 70% level, um, that makes them more likely to jump to a new, um, a new square. And uh, any one person, just a single individual, they'll jump to another square, which is seen as better matching their preferences. Um, but collectively over time with enough people doing that, you get the emergence of these patterns that are eerily reminiscent of patterns of segregation or reds cluster with reds, blacks cluster with blacks. And, um, and then we have some um, boundaries often between those groups, which are empty. Um, disconcerting in the sense that uh, a modest preference of an individual to, leave, uh, to live with others like them can lead to these macroscopic patterns. This microscopic behavior involving one individual can lead to these, these overall patterns. And of course, the degree of of uh, the significance of those patterns um, or their, their extent, their scope, their size will depend on the extent of their preferences. Um, so the lower their preferences to have, to have people like them, um, the, the smaller the degree of segregation, the higher the preferences, the uh, the, the larger the patterns of segregation. So if it's, for example, just about 50%, we'll get somewhat smaller patterns. By contrast, if it's something like 70%, we'll get larger patterns. And if it is something like, like 90%, we'll get another situation yet where people 
will just not be satisfied. They are so intolerant of others who don't look like them, they are going to be moving around uh, uh, on a perpetual basis uh, within this model. Um, now, this model is actually not exactly Schelling's segregation model. Um, and uh, it actually has uh, several differences. And one of them is reflecting that last scenario. This last scenario involving people moving around in the original Schelling segregation model, someone moves to a new neighborhood only if it is more preferable than their, their, current, um, their current neighborhood. Whereas in this model, my recollection is that uh, if we go look in person here, for example, um, here and on before step, this is a discrete time model. We've talked about that in previous classes. So all the agents are updated together. And in order for that not to have dependency on who's updated first, they first collect all the information they need to make their decisions, which in this case is their number of neighbors of the same color. And then um, on the step, having gotten all the information they need to do their job, now all the agents actually move, but, but their movement won't um, change the behavior of other agents in that time step because they've already um, collected all the information they need. So in this model, they jump to a random empty cell, whereas in the really original segre shelling segregation model, they actually jump to another to another space only if it is uh, at least as good as their current space and and uh, it may be strictly better. Okay, so we've seen this model before. I won't I won't dwell on it, but I want to show you a an alternate version of it. And so specifically, um, I'd like you to download from the canvas site. there's a a model that's called uh, continuous time. Shelling segregation with free cell list version eight, no less. Okay, so we're going to go load that one in. I'm going to close this one off. And this is going to be um, another bit of a variant on shelling segregation, but it's going to be much closer to the original shelling segregation. The big difference is that it's going to be in continuous time, not discrete time. So people can, with a certain hazard rate, a certain chance per unit time of one per unit time, in this case, a minute, which is um, the time unit of the model inexplicably, um, uh, they will consider a move. And when considering a move, um, they will, um, They'll they'll move only if the best one that they've found is um, uh, is greater than or equal to to the to the current one, in which case they'll move. So we're going to run this um, model, and uh, we're going to oh okay. Uh, so something is okay. I must have typed something wrong. Uh oh. Uh oh. Um, pardon me here. I I must have uh, futzed with something here after opening it. Continuous time shelling segregation. Here we go. Let's make sure that works fine. Nope. Uh oh. Okay. So somehow this model got screwed up. Um. Okay. This is uh, this is my bad and. I must have, yeah, but but this is looking like it got um, more foundationally messed up. Um, is is the one on the course site also messed up in that way? Can anyone say? Are you also having trouble with it? Anyone say? I'll go download it. Um, and go download it. 
Sorry, I, I can't hear that. What's that? Uh, stand by. Okay, I'm opening it up here, the one from the actual course site. Uh, uh, okay, this one is, okay, okay, good, good. So that one's fine. So from the course site, download it, and, and we can run it. Let's, let's go run it here. Um, here we're going to have, I should have said, not just two groups, but we'll actually have six groups. Um, I'm sorry, I should have highlighted this. Black, red, green, blue, orange, lime, and cyan. So that's seven groups, okay. Um, and let's go run it here. We're going to... And, sorry? Th this thing? This thing? Okay. Um, th that's my picture of people and so on, but... Um, I'll I'll move it down here. Generally, I'd like to, I can see if people raise their hands and so on on that. Um, so uh, I'm going to run this. And here we have the seven different groups and uh, there is assortment going on. There is uh, people in these seven gr different groups that isn't helping, um, moving to be adjacent to others like them. And you can see these groups forming uh, as well. Now, in this model, we can adjust more things than uh, we could in the in the built-in one in any logic. Um, for example, we could look at the effects if there was initially low crowding uh, in the model. Um, and I'm going to therefore run this neighborhood radius one low crowding here. Uh, and yeah, their their moving depends on on the degree to which they are satisfied in their current neighborhood. Yeah, compared to and, and that depends on who around them looks like them. Um, so if we have low initial crowding, we can have this clustering into different neighborhoods of similar type. Um, quite readily. By contrast, if you have something like high crowding here, so there's very few spaces around to which uh, a given person could move, very, very few opportunities for, for moving to a new place that might offer them greater accordance with their cherished prejudices. It's gonna take more time for these clusters to emerge. They will emerge, but it, it takes comparatively low time or more time rather. Um, uh, and uh, it's more kind of a piecemeal process and there's less separation. We could also look, for example, how far out they consider um, their preferences. So let's look at neighborhood radius five low crowding scenario. So here they're, caring about their neighbors, not only right around them, but in a broader radius around them. And we can run this. And uh, this is with low crowding. I'm going to, to turn off this uh, light here. Um, but what will, what will end up coming out of this one is larger patches of of uh, contiguous cells. So homophily, people will move to be next to others and in contact with others like them, but in, um, in, in eventually large, large patterns. Uh, if we were to look at the, the uh, high crowding corresponding one, we might see it, it also, um, uh, having similar patterns emerge out over time. Um, so we could vary certain things here. We could ask what if people, to what degree are people satisfied by themselves, um, for example. And, uh, and if they are satisfied by themselves, they may be willing to move to just be surrounded by, uh, by empty space. Whereas if they are unsatisfied uh, alone, 
they will tend to clump together. So this is a very low crowding situation where people are comfortable by themselves. And you see fewer clusterings here because there's more people that are just kind of vacuously satisfied by themselves. Vacuously, I mean, um, that their need for uh, all neighbors to look like them or more neighbors to look like them is kind of vacuously um, uh, true. It, it, they have no neighbor. So here with lo very low crowding, but satisfied by themselves. Um, here's another case with very low crowding, but they're not satisfied by themselves. They actually need to, to live near neighbors who, who are, are close to them. They don't want to live just by themselves. Um, uh, that would also allow, that would also lead to, to dissatisfaction. And here, what you will end up seeing, and you can see it already to some degree, is um, is individuals starting to coalesce into these kind of contiguous groups. They're groups that involve some holes in them, or some. Um, uh, it's it's not as tightly clustered as before, but they are forming up in sort of similar areas here. So. Here we're, uh, we're looking at a situation where we have a model which involves simple uh, distinction between different groups. Individuals are placed in 2D space, given a chance to move if their neighbors, um, uh, if, if the fraction of their neighbors who are their same group doesn't, doesn't constitute a certain, doesn't reach a certain threshold. And um, in that case, they will move if they can find a they find a space that um, that looks that has a greater fraction of their neighbors uh, near them who look like them near um, uh, around it. And uh, this leads to this sort of coalescence, um, although with some tolerance here for for neighbors who are. Uh, for for some space between them, because if a person has even one has just one neighbor, and that being their same type, they're satisfied um, in this uh, in this model, and it leads to sort of um, these diffuse groups um, uh, that that play out. Okay, so this is a Schelling segregation model. Uh, we can see type groups coming out of it. We can see um, more diffuse groups coming out of it. Um, and uh, those groups tend to coalesce regardless of how far out a person um, looks, that groups will, will end up being formed as long as they're seeking to, to move to others um, uh, who are more, more like them in their characteristic. Um, this is a model which has led to some significant insights about the practice of, of, of segregation. Segregation is a very troubling phenomenon that's been quite widely studied and been found in empirical practice to, to reflect many different uh, factors, including predatory lending and um, residential steering, whereby real estate agents steer people to certain neighborhoods rather than others based on their characteristics, based on um, discomfort um, that does lead someone uh, in a certain neighborhood where they feel like an, they are not valued as a minority to move out, et cetera. Um, uh, opportunities for, for interaction with others of similar uh, language groups. But what this shows is that a very simple set of rules involving people situated in space who, who are of a certain group who care about the composition of their neighbors and particularly need a certain fraction of people around them to look like them, that can lead to these macroscopic patterns of segregation if they move in response to, um, to that threshold not being met. Okay, so, so that's the Schelling segregation model. Next, we're going to just um, uh, remind ourselves of the game of life. And uh, the game of life is again a, a built in one here on any logic. So we'll close this Schelling segregation model. 
and we will go again to the example models and go down and have and open up the game of life. We introduced this at several points, including to introduce discrete time. And I had noted many features of this model at that point. Here, like the previous model, each individual is placed into a, um, a gridded set of squares. Um, like the previous model, a square can be empty, a patch can be empty, or in this case, it can be occupied, but we make no distinction between groups in the default version of this model. And uh, at any one time, a patch is either living or dead. Unlike the previous model, there's no mobility. There's no movement of a person or of an agent from one space to the other. A cell is either live or dead. The patch is either occupied or unoccupied. But what determines whether it remains occupied or not is the current state of the model. This is a dynamic system. And as such, its evolution at any little bit of time over the next little bit of time will depend on its current state. So um, here we have the current state of the model. And uh, if you have a, uh, a red square here, that means it's occupied. Um, this sort of yellow color means it's unoccupied. A red square, one that's occupied right now, during the, for the next time step from now, whether or not it's occupied, whether or not a cell is occupied will depend on the current state. For a red cell, whether it stays living will depend on the number of neighbors it has uh, in this time in the current state. If it has two or three neighbors, it will continue to live. Um, otherwise, it will die off. It will be an, become an empty patch. By contrast, an empty patch will only turn into a living patch uh, in the next time step if in this this current state, this current time step, it has three, exactly three living neighbors. So for example, I had argued this one here would be born because it has one, two, three neighbors. We count neighbors in the cardinal directions, north, southeast, west, plus northwest, north, northeast, southwest, southeast. And so this one will be born and this one will be born. This one, which what will happen to this one? Will it live or die the next time step? It'll die. It only has one neighbor. It's too lonely. It'll die off. How about this one on the other side? Die. Good. How about the middle one? Yeah, it has two neighbors, so it will continue to live. So this one will actually blink back and forth, just like that. Um, some of these others are more complicated in their evolution. And I noted there's higher level structures, emergent structures that result from this, that give the appearance of moving, for example, but, and, and that's a glider there moving, and then it collided with something. But in truth is um, nothing, there's no mobility at a microscopic level, only at a mesoscopic scale, at the scale of these, kind of emergent phenomena. And this game is, is this game of life is intriguing for many reasons, um, including it being computationally universal. But the, the main point I wanna offer is this is a game with very simple rules. Um, uh, I summarized those rules to you just a minute or two ago. And uh, yet it can give rise because of those microscopic rules, it can give rise to mesoscopic uh, behavior, to behavior at the next level up, which is very rich. And in fact, uh, macroscopic behavior, behavior of the, of the system as a whole uh, uh, can, can end up being affected by this microscopic, very simple rule. So you can have great complexity generated by very, very simple rules here. Um, but, what I want to go you know, beyond here is, is that initial description to, to talk about another feature of this situation, which may not be obvious, which is the degree to which this model has very, um, uh, very particular dependence uh, on those specific rules, okay? Um, 
And I'm gonna explore this at two levels. So first of all, I've provided you in the slides for anyone interested in the implementation of this, and I'm gonna advance the slides here, um, uh, a sort of some guidance about how this model is put together, how it's defined, the ways in which it's, um, it's characterized. Um, but uh, what I wanna highlight here is the rule for its evolution. So if we go to the cell within this model up here, cell, and we go look within this agent actions area, we'll see several different types of agent actions. Uh, as before, we have one that runs to collect information needed for the agent to figure out how it's going to involve, and then one that performs the evolutionary step um, based on the information that was already created. Um, because we separate those two, um, one cell evolving doesn't immediately affect the others. Um, it, uh, we have all the information about the others that were around us, um, if the others around us now evolve before we do, it won't change our, um, our decision about what we're going to do, which is dictated by, by the information we collected before. So here's the basic rule. This rule says, look, um, um, I will uh, remain alive in this, or I will be alive in this next time step if I'm alive now and... I have between two and three neighbors inclusive. Um, or by implication, if I'm not alive now, and um, in other words, it's empty and I've, I have three neighbors. I'd like to change these, okay? I'd like to, to examine um, sensitivities. This is the, the game of, of life here. Um, and uh, I'd like to, to change it to allow for survival up to four neighbors here, okay? So what we're going to do is we're gonna change this rule here to allow a cell to survive. That's what this rule is. It's already living and it needs between two and three neighbors. I'm gonna let it survive up to four neighbors. And you could be excused for thinking, well, we're more generous about letting it survive. so. The board is going to be more filled with cells, and th that's a reasonable um, uh, first first guess. We're more accommodating, so we would think there'd be more cells surviving. So I'm not going to run this model. We've actually modified the rule here. Now we don't have. We're not running game of life per se. We're running a variant of game of life here, um, and you'll notice the dynamics is rather different. We still have these blinkers, because after all, it dies out if you only have one neighbor um, and it still lives if you have two neighbors. But what's emerging is a, is a rather different eventual pattern. Um, it's a pattern which has a great deal of structure, a great deal of order in it that might not have been anticipated. Yes, there's a larger fraction of the overall set of cells that are occupied, but there's also this orderliness to it, this kind of regularity to it, which is quite different, profoundly different than the sort of complex evolving um, underlying dynamics we saw with, with two neighbors. Um, so that's allowing a cell to continue to live if, if it has between two and four neighbors instead of just two and three. And that induced you know, a dramatic change in kind of the order parameter and the, the orderliness of the result, the complexity of the result. Now we have something whose complexity that could be described actually much more succinctly. Most of it is barely evolving at all. Um, or uh, most of it is not evolving at all. It's in a steady state with just a few components evolving. And of course you can click on this um, and, uh, engage in a perturbation of it, and it will reconfigure accordingly. I might click on this, for example. Some of these clicks might not make a difference. Um, some may just uh, lead to a replacement, and others may lead to a 
you know, dramatic reconfiguration that sort of um, knocks around and then gets back to a low energy state. So this is the game of life. Um, let's, uh, or that's a variant of the game of life with four. Let's, let's try it with five neighbors. Let's, let's, let's allow it to, to live with five. Um, and, you know, you might try to think again, maybe, maybe this will lead to a more packed board here. Um, uh, but we see something that looks a little bit reminiscent of, of what we had just seen, but not, not quite, quite the same. You, you'd have to really study it to try to quantify some of the differences between the dynamics here. Um, but uh, it is something which also exhibits this, uh, this degree of order. Similarly, we could change it to instead of um, allowing, uh, changing the upper bound, maybe we allow a cell to live with, with one neighbor, not with zero, but with one. And we could go run that. Um, so uh, a, a cell will continue to be alive if it has even a single neighbor. Now these things no longer blank because one neighbor is enough. We see some patterns vaguely reminiscent to the original game of life, uh, but we end up seeing, you know, a pattern that's quite, quite entropic uh, for a lot of it around the borders, where there's often few neighbors, um, only neighbors in the internal, no neighbors on the side. We see some orderliness, but otherwise it's kind of evolving in a, in a very very noisy sort of way, although you can kind of see a, a, a bit of order whispered, you know, through that, that evolution. In short, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this game of life, we'll change it back to one, this game of life uh, exhibits uh, real sensitivities to the details of the rules. If we, if we try to get very similar dynamics um, out of uh, a changed rule, it can be quite hard to arrive at something as rich as, as that particular balance achieved with the built-in rules to game of life. Going and perturbing the rules, you might think changing them slightly will lead to slight behaviors in changes, uh, slight behavioral changes, slight changes in the emergent behaviors. But Generally, that's not the case. There can be these profound shifts in behavior of the emergent patterns from a very small change to those rules. Um, and of course, we could play around with that uh, a lot more, but that's a bit distant from, um, from our experience and our interests in, in, in health. And I'd like to really focus in on two models that speak to issues more fundamental in, in human experience and more uh, central to issues in, in, in the health sphere, including in infectious diseases. These are models that get into matters of trust, get into models of matters of forgiveness, get into matters of reciprocity uh, in ways that bear, bear some thinking and can give some real insights. So let's go back to our slides, and we'll end up um, uh, we'll end up jumping into those models. So uh, for those, I'm going to be also exploring uh, an initial model. But let's um, let's jump uh, jump forward with with some slides to give a bit of an introduction. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. One final thing on this game of life. I'd said I was gonna introduce two types of changes here. One were changes to the rules. The other one, I wanted to introduce a continuous time version of it. We have a discrete time version, when we're all, one where all the cells update in lockstep. Um, they all compute all the information they need to evolve, and then boom, they all evolve together and they're on to the next time step. What if we had instead a continuous time version of this, uh, as I've provided to you? One where cells update 
you know, according to um, uh, a certain tempo, a certain frequency, but they, you know, one will update it at slightly different times to another. So there's one that should be called here, um, continuous time game of life. And I'm, I'm wondering uh, game of life, continuous time game of life rectangles, okay? So I'd like you to download that one, okay? Uh, and if you go open that, we will see the game, a version of the game of life with its traditional rules, but in continuous time. Um, and when we talk about how changing rules slightly can change behavior, observed emergent behavior in big ways, um, it's natural to wonder whether the same might be true about this. So here, if we double click on patch, we'll see a patch is either empty or living. And uh, whether an empty patch goes to become an empty patch uh, depends on a certain death rate. Um, and uh, it will stay living if it remains alive. And what determines if it remains alive? Well, if it has between two and three neighbors, um, otherwise it goes to this. And similarly, if it's empty um, with a certain colonization rate, it'll become alive. And that depends on whether it's colonized and whether it's colonized depends if it's living neighbors or three. So same rules that we've been dealing with, but now these, these quantities are in continuous time. It's a certain chance per unit time. They could occur at any time. And in general, the time when one patch updates will be different from another patch. So let's go see what comes of this, if we could. Um, I'm going to uh, initially start with a model that is sparse. Um, the original model had about 10% of its uh, that that built-in model on any logic had 10% of its space empty or, or filled, and so it is here. So I'm going to run a, a sparse one, okay? Um, so we're going to have 10% of this space filled up with the familiar game of life rules, but in continuous time. So here we go. So we're going to run it, and you'll see something which should remind you of, of the game of life initially, but it ends up going in a different direction. Um, and if you run this out uh, over time, you will see same basic rules of game of life in terms of whether a cell lives or dies, but types of patterns um, that emerge from it, which are quite profoundly different. Um, they they end up having this kind of orderliness we saw when we allowed cells to survive, for example, between two and four, with two and four neighbors. Um, uh, now, uh, I'm going to now change colonization rate. So that'll be this rate here. If a cell is empty, how how quickly it's colonized um, will change. Will slow that down. And we might expect, you know, some changes to the, um, the the patterns that result. Maybe fewer will end up being being colonized. And indeed, we end up seeing something that looks quite a quite similar to things we might have seen in the original game of life with these blocks and kind of these uh, patterns here. Not quite the same, I think, but. Um, which are, are, are fairly stable, uh, stable here. Okay, um, now we'll try slow death. So here, cells that are living will um, uh, be candidates for death less frequently. That relates to this, um, to this uh, transition. So here we go. And as you might expect, you get this growth because death is less frequent, there's less turnover. And now what we get is a 
somewhat more stable pattern um, in this kind of rectilinear uh, matrix, as it were, uh, with less depth going on. This is sort of knits together these domains. And you can almost see there are these domains of kind of similar structure here in patches um, that have emerged. This one is order, ordered um, upwards facing, this way sideways facing, here's another upwards facing, here's another sideways facing. Um, and, and these two are different because this sideways, side to side facing is on a different kind of um, uh, uh, different level than this one. They're, they're different phase as it were. Um, game of life, same rules, continuous time, profoundly different look. Um, and once again, it points to this general observation that slight modifications to these discrete rules, um, to these rules involving living or dying based on the number of neighbors that you have, um, can lead to big changes in outcome, um, large changes in outcome. Uh, it's it's the nature of this. This is a very, very sensitive system. What we're conducting here, what we'll know, we'll know as sensitivity analyses, how sensitive this model is to parameters. And it turns out in this case, it's profoundly sensitive. And it's sensitive in ways that are sometimes surprising to, to see the consequences. But let's Let's go on to something that's closer to the human experience, closer to the, to the human theater. I'm going to load in a model that is special significance for me personally. This is a model that I started experimenting with in the, um, in the opening months of the 1990s, um, my first uh, job. Um, using cellular automata and agent-based models for research among a set of computational physicists at MIT's Lab for Computer Science. Um, but I was interested in social phenomena and using these models to probe social phenomena. And I had read about a year or two earlier as an undergraduate, um, this work being conducted by Robert Axelrod at University of Michigan. Um, uh, which involved um, this construct called the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, and we're going to uh, um, be examining here uh, a setup that I explored in those opening months of my work with, uh, with agent-based models and research um, that puts the prisoner's dilemma um, in a spatial context, okay? Um, so, what we're going to do is, is con consider a situation, which is known as the prisoner's dilemma, where we have um, pairs of interacting individuals, okay? Um, and uh, for a given interaction, a given episode of interaction between individual A and individual B, um, uh, each individual can make a dichotomous decision between what's called cooperating and defecting. Now the words here are indic are reference to the name prisoner's dilemma. And I need to I need to refer to that. I need to to better explain that. So the term prisoner's dilemma refers to a situation where there's two two uh, individuals who have engaged in lawbreaking who are arrested by police and they're separated. These two individuals, they've engaged in some um, in some criminal behavior. They've broken some laws um, together, and they're separated in in and in being interrogated by the police. And uh, the question is, will they um, will the the prisoners who agreed um, that if they get caught, they're not going to betray each other? Will they? continue to cooperate with each other. It's important you understand cooperate is meaning cooperate 
between the two prisoners. Um, in other words, they'll they'll stick by their plan to to not betray the other, or will they defect? In which case, they betray the other in hopes of getting a more lenient uh, uh, sentence themselves. So the question is, each of them, prisoner A, prisoner B, are they going to both stick by their plan and and come out with an outcome where they both deny it and both might have a light be treated lightly and, and let go? Or is, for example, um, it, it might I cooperate, but um, uh, another individual defects, um, uh, excuse me, another individual defects, uh, excuse me, ah. so I'm cooperating as one prisoner. Um, uh, and the question is, will the other uh, prisoner cooperate? If they cooperate as well, in other words, stick by their plans to, to avoid um, betraying uh, me, then we might, might both be let off lightly. By contrast, if the other prisoner um, uh, defects uh, against me. Um, uh, so this should actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm uh, uh, right. These two are actually reversed here, right? Uh, exactly. Um, so if I'm, if I'm uh, my prisoner and I'm a prisoner and I cooperate with the, both prisoners cooperate, they don't betray each other, they get let off lightly. By contrast, if I cooperate and the other defects, then I'm really in trouble because I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about the other prisoner. I'm saying we just didn't do it, but the other prisoner is saying he did it, he did it. And that leads me to be the one blamed. And so it take it dings me. It takes it, it's it's really negative for me. If the other prisoner is implicating me while well, I'm not seeking to implicate them, it ends me in a bad situation. By contrast, if I defect and the other prisoner cooperates, I might be rewarded for being the informant and the other prisoner, um, and I benefit. Of course, the other prisoner would be worse off, but we're considering the benefit to me. This is, for, for me, I gain the most by, by betraying them and, uh, and you know, being um, being viewed as an informant, uh, and uh, but if if we both defect, if both of us defect, um, it's moderately bad for both of us. We're each implicating the other, and we'll both be punished, but no one will be disproportionately punished. So, in other words, we'll we'll all receive a minus one instead of a minus two. Instead of being totally blamed, they'll be partially blamed for it. So this is the prisoner's dilemma. The outcomes for myself here are specified in this table. Um, if, if we consider what the other person does, which is not under my control, um, in both cases, it seems like it's better for me to defect. Consider, consider um, my choice to defecting or cooperating. If this other person is going to cooperate, if they're gonna stick by me, um, and I defect, well, uh, basically, uh, I'm going to be treated as an informant, they'll be blamed, and I'll, I'll really benefit. I might get out scot-free. By contrast, if they defect, I'm better off defecting as well, um, because, uh, you know, th then we'll both be blamed instead of just me being blamed. So here, it would seem from a single standpoint of a single interaction, from a narrow perspective of self-interest, it's always best for me to defect. It, regardless of what the other does, if they cooperate, it's better for me to defect. Two is bigger, is better than one. By contrast, if they defect, minus one is better than minus two. Um, I'm less harmed uh, if, if they're defecting by me defecting. So from a narrow perspective, it would always seem best to defect, but it would seem best for them to defect. Of course, what's the best thing for both of us, if you consider the best outcome for both of us, it's to both cooperate. Um, if we both cooperate, neither of us ends off better off, uh, ends off worse off. Um, we have a, a positive outcome for both of us, one and one, instead of, for example, 
two and minus two if I defect and they cooperate. Um, uh, or, or a situation where you know I'm dinged because they cooperate and I defect. It's always best, um, it would seem, uh, for an individual to defect, but in terms of the collective outcome, it's best to both cooperate and neither is, ends up being harmed. Um, both avoid, avoid harm and, uh, and uh, both end up you know, getting not able to be, to be really well blamed for it, to be, to be uh, blamed. So this is the prisoner's dilemma. It's a dilemma because um, from an arrow perspective, it seems worse to defect, but from the perspective of both together, um, it'd be nice if both could cooperate. And the ironic thing here, and partly part of the, the dilemma is, um, from the perspective of both prisoners, if only they could, you know, coordinate, um, they would probably cooperate. Um, you know, that's the thing that's that that would yield the best outcome. It would be if they could both cooperate, but because they can't communicate, each is tempted to betray the other, which leads to a worse outcome this minus one where both betrays the, both betray the other. Um, and much of the dilemma is how do we, you know, um, how, how can we square this that for both of them, it's best to cooperate, but they end up both defecting. You can find versions of the prisoner's dilemma all throughout society. Um, you could argue that it occurs with a lot of environmental considerations for companies where, you know, a company wants to do perhaps uh, based on their internal values, the, the, the right thing, but they feel that if they, you know, put their efforts into um, trying to mitigate, you know, climate um, impacts of their industries and their, and their competitors don't, they will be worse off. Um, you know, it would be better if all of them could, could uh, mitigate their climate related impacts but instead, you often get a situation where none of them really do when it's greenwashing. Um, I'm oversimplifying the situation, but there's a lot of situations in life where, you know, what's narrowly the best is not collectively the best. And the prisoner's dilemma um, is precisely dealing with that situation. Collectively, this is the best outcome, cooperate, cooperate. But um, with each party, they are tempted to defect defect, which leads to a very bad outcome for both. Um, okay, now, what I explored in 1990, starting in 1990, and what I've explored with you here in this model, this um, uh, prisoner's dilemma model that you can download, is a situation where we put the prisoner's dilemma um, rules in a spatial context, okay? Um, and so I've, I've just downloaded it. And if you wanna open that, that will be good. So here we're going to place agents in a 2D grid uh, and they'll be connected with their neighbors, okay? By default in, uh, in eight directions, I believe. Um, so let's, uh, let's go uh, take a look at this. So we're going to um, have uh, this prisoner's dilemma model. I will just run it here for a moment um, so you can give a sense of what it looks like. And, and so each agent is gonna be placed uh, in this 2D grid and each agent will have a specific strategy. And here we're treating the strategies for a given agent as being fixed, okay? They, they have a particular strategy how to deal with other agents. And we'll talk about several such strategies in a moment. Each agent is further associated with non-negative energy. So each agent has here, if you go look at person uh, and you scroll up, they have an they have some amount of current energy, which is a double precision value. It's a real value. Um, and um, if it goes to zero, if it goes down to zero, they die, okay? And they will become, that cell will become empty. Um, how does the energy change? Well, it, 
reflects these interactions with each of its neighbors. So each agent here interacts with each of its neighbors according to a prisoner's dilemma sort of situation. They either at any one time, they cooperate or defect with their neighbor. So we treat the neighbor as like a fellow prisoner. And the question is, are they cooperative with that fellow prisoner or do they defect against them trying to get the, the rewards of, of betraying that prisoner um, or, or at least limiting their ability to betray us. Um, and so with each of their neighbors, each time step, they're undergoing one of these prisoner's dilemma uh, interactions. And empty cells here can be colonized by bordering, neighbor, by bordering neighbors, where if a neighbor spreads into an empty cell, its energy is divided by two, okay? Um, so this is the idea. Now, what are the strategies of which I spoke? Um, oh, where are my, where are my strategies? I, I listed out the strategies, here they are. Um, uh, so the strategies that I've, I've uh, placed here are common ones um, from the literature and from Axelrod's work. They, an agent could be always cooperate. This is kind of a, an agent who um, is committed to always treating those around them in a cooperative way, even if it puts themselves at risk. And of course, what this risks is if this agent, the self, is, is cooperating um, and their neighbor defects against them, boy, that's going to decrease the energy level. It subtracts the energy of the self of the one is cooperating by two. Uh, if their neighbor defects against them. By contrast, if the neighbor cooperates with them, it'll go up by one, right? Um, um, so, so green is always cooperate. So there, they're always going to be undertaking this first row here. If the neighbor around them is cooperate, they will benefit by gaining one point of energy. If the neighbor defects, they will lose two points of energy, right? Um, so that's one type of, of agent. That's one strategy that agents can have. And those are the green ones that are, are on this board here, right? Those are these ones uh, here, the, the green, uh, the light green. Okay. Another type of neighbor is always defect. This is a cynical neighbor who's always pursuing the second row. And you could think of them as kind of short-sightedly, narrowly selfish. And they say, look, look, no matter what the other person is going to do for this round, I'm going to be better off if I defect. If the other person cooperates, I will get two points. I, my energy will go up by two. Um, by contrast, uh, if the other person defects, I will lose one instead of losing two. Instead of losing two, I would have. If I cooperate, I'll only lose one. So the idea is that narrowly speaking, they say, I'm going to defect. Okay. Um, and uh, so always defect um, is engaged in, um, in, in very consistently in this second round. Um, there's two other sorts of agents or two other strategies amongst the agents. Oh, I should have emphasized, sorry. The always defects are the red here. Um, and, uh, and those are the predatory ones. Um, there's two other strategies that I've explored here. You can come up with your own strategies and I, I would welcome you to explore this if you wanna modify this model or build an alternative. One is tit for tat, and the idea there is I'm going to do whatever the person last did to me. So if, if I'm cooperating with you, I'm going to repeat back whatever you did to me last. So if you've treated me well, if you cooperated with me last time, I will cooperate with you this time. Uh, if you betrayed me last time, I'm going to betray you next time, you know, um, uh, sort of an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth sort of thing, right? I, I will I will do to you what you've done to me. Um, 
And importantly, for the initial time step, this is critical, they give the benefit of the doubt and initially cooperate. They say, look, I'll give someone the benefit of the doubt first. I will, I will cooperate with them. Um, but after that, I'll do whatever they've done to me. So if they if they treat me badly, I'm gonna, they're gonna get the same thing back in kind, just right back at them, right? Um, but this assumes perfect knowledge of what the other person did. And so there's another one which explores what I think is an interesting phenomenon that's very important in this context where uh, you have, you have, uh, in, you have fallible, you're very, um, um, you have incomplete, you have um, limited knowledge um, and potentially error prone knowledge of what the other person has done. This, this reflects misunderstandings in the world. Someone tried to treat you well, but you misread it as a situation of they've betrayed you. They, they you, you misread it as, you know, they uh, defected against you. So they were trying perhaps to cooperate with you, but you misread it. Um, so here we have a sensitivity and specificity for how sensitive are they in detecting um, an attempt to, to defect against me and how specific. Could I impute them betraying me when actually it was not intended? It was, it was, it was an accident. It was, you know, misreading of their intentions. Okay, so let's. Let's take this model. This model is an extremely rich model. Um, and uh, I, I explored it uh, a great deal in 1990 alongside a, uh, a young professor, um, John Buys uh, from UC Riverside, who recently is a big collaborator with us on our category theory work. Um, uh, but in a lesson learned, we. We didn't publish it, and then a few years later, it was a, someone else basically did the same thing several years later in a way that made nationwide headlines and the front page of the New York Times, actually the Science Times, um, from uh, the Science section in the New York Times. So here we're setting up all all four of these. So we have some fraction of always cooperate initially, always defect, tit for tat, and. Um, uh, with with imperfect and um, imperfect and and uh, perfect and imperfect knowledge. So we're going to start running it, and you can imagine what starts happening. Let's consider this red one next to these green ones. How is it? How is this red one going to interact with the green? Can anyone say this red one with this green one? What's going to happen there? Anyone? Yeah, so green is going to be cooperating with red, but red's going to be trying to take advantage of it. Um, but fortunately, green is these other neighbors. Uh, so, so the light blue, the teal is uh, imperfect um, tit for tat. The uh, perfect tit for tat is blue. The green is always cooperate. The red is 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 always defect. And what what you start to see is um, spaces opening up, and those spaces reflect the fact that energy has gone to zero. Um, we could track this more. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna restart it so you could see it out play out more slowly here. Um, so for example, uh, maybe pay attention to uh, this red one here, this red one here, and uh, uh, you might pay attention to um, Let's see, well, um, uh, so it's already moving too quickly. Okay, so some of these died off. This, in general, this is a uh, red one. This one died off and was replaced by blue. This one got replaced by a blue. The reds are trying to exploit their neighbors um, uh, and, and uh, they do so as long as they have neighbors that they can exploit. But if they have a neighbor that's tit for tat, they'll start fighting them back, right? Um, and uh, and if they have a neighbor that's always cooperate, they can kind of leech off them for for a while, um, try to take advantage of them, and end up colonizing some. But the reds tend to fight with each other as well. They tend to try to exploit each other uh, also. And 
you end up having um, over time a kind of uh, weed down of the reds. So always defect is only 2%. It started by about a quarter of all. Always cooperate is about 20%. Those are sort of the most altruistic giving uh, individuals. Tit for tat with imperfect is like 37%. And with perfect knowledge, it's about 39%. Um, and this has led to a bit of an ecosystem here. Um, you, you do have always cooperate around um, uh, mixed in with tit for tat, with imperfect and perfect knowledge. And always defect has been minimized. Let's go see what happens if we have always cooperate with always defect alone. What do you think will happen here? Anyone? What do you think if we have always cooperate with always defect alone? None of the none of the others, just those. What do you think will happen? Yeah, so the red will start to take advantage of the green, right? Um, and the green is, it's going to be able to deal with each other well and build up energy, but their energy is being sapped by the red around them. But notice the red, the reds are exploiting the other reds too because they're predatory and they're eating their own, right? Um, and so they're getting thinned out, but they can live off the greens. Um, they, they sort of live off in a, in, a, in a predatory fashion, the edges of the greens and try to exploit the greens. Now, the, some lucky greens have now formed their own little colonies there where they're free of these uh, predators and, and are spreading out. But uh, over time, they might come back in contact with the predators in ways that will, will start to see them become vulnerable again. And if you run it out over time, what you end up seeing is the always cooperate end up winning out uh, in terms of numbers, but these red ones are, are still able to, at, at low levels, about 2.5%, try to exploit their neighbors um, and, uh, and take advantage of their, their you know, continued goodwill towards them. So here, um, we, we do have, and if you scroll up, you can see this builds up the energy. Uh, interestingly, if you go from the very beginning, I'm plotting out mean energy up at the top, and I will, I will slow this down here. But if you, if you plot out the mean energy, initially it really drops um, as you have diversity go down and, and you know, we have, um, Yeah, now it's it's going up as as the um, as the always cooperate start to spread. Okay, now let's look at always defect perfect tit for tat. So here you have individuals, you know, uh, uh, fighting back against this. They'll give someone the benefit of the doubt first. They'll if if they're dealing with another tit for tat, they will. They will be initially cooperative with each other and continue to cooperate. But if they're dealing with defects, they will be, you know, pushing back against the defects, right? Um, and what's happened is basically you've had tit for tat completely take over because the always defects ended up going extinct because they got pushed back by the, the tit for tat. Um, however, um, now let's start to consider a situation where we have uh, always, uh, uh, where we have uh, a situation of tit for tat, but where misunderstandings can come in. So here, 99% um, of the time, they'll detect the defect, but 5% of the time, they will misrecognize a a uh, situation where someone has tried to cooperate as a defect um, and take action accordingly. Uh, what do you think that will lead to? If, they, if this is tit for tat and they 5% of the time they misread a cooperate uh, as a defect. Um, uh, so I'm sorry, I, I, I think I ran the, uh, oh, here it is. It's called only 
low specificity tit for tat. I'm sorry, low specificity tit, only low specificity tit for tat. So here we have low specificity tit for tat, and we're going to start running it. And what, what we see here is, is a situation where you have a space. E each of these are, are tit for tat, but there's some misunderstandings that come in. And two neighbors here might both initially be cooperating and they're cooperating with each other consistently, but then one misreads the other as having defected. And then what happens? If they misread the other as having defected, what will they themselves start to do? Well, okay, so suppose A and B are interacting. Initially, they're both cooperating. And, and then at some point, A misreads a cooperative action by B as a defect. Then what will happen? What will A do in return? It will, anyone? It will well, defect back because it thinks it's defecting. What will B now do? Defect. So they get into these fights with each other based on these misunderstandings, right? They get into these fights which ruin a, an otherwise nice relationship. Um, and it's a race to the bottom there. Um, with fewer and fewer of these cells left. And it ends up kind of petering on for a while. And then inevitably these fights take a toll and it goes extinct. Um, by contrast, if you had um, perfect tit for tad, it'll, man, it will, they'll they'll continue to cooperate and they have no problems with each other no misunderstandings and the energy just goes up and up and up and up because they're always cooperating with each other they started initially cooperating and then they continue to cooperate um so always so low if if there's misunderstandings that come in it can lead to the situation where otherwise viable strategies like tit for tat turn agonistic and they start to pound on each other with no capacity here for forgiveness and they can go extinct. Um, now, uh, you'll notice that uh, if we put them into, a, into a, a collection, here it's always cooperate, always defect, and, and only this type of tit for tat that has misunderstandings. That's the teal one here. So green is always cooperate. Um, uh, the teal is is the ones with uh, misunderstandings. Um, but you'll notice here, for example, uh, tit for the the um, version of tit for tat with the misunderstandings um, is actually thriving quite quite well. In fact, um, uh, while it's not at the numbers of always cooperate it's far above the levels of always defect. Uh, why is that? Why do you think that is? Why can tit for tat here thrive um, despite having some misunderstandings? What can happen here? Anyone? Well, suppose one of these tit for tat with imperfect perceptions is dealing with an always cooperate. What's gonna happen then? Anyone? What will happen if, if uh, so th that's that's true, but these imperfect tit for tat, these tit for tat with imperfect perception of the situation, if they misperceive and always cooperate as seeking to hurt them, for example, um, see but the defect against them. They will defect back to always cooperate. But what will happen then? What will always cooperate do next? Well, okay, it's gonna help the, it's gonna help. Um, okay, so one will, so the one that's in, has imperfect knowledge, imperfect tit for tat, 
will defect. You always cooperate, will cooperate back. And, and that will benefit that always, that tit for tat. But then what will happen? Now, what will tit for tat do after that? Well, it'll just repeat the cooperation that it got last time. And so it won't get into these fights that it does with itself where you know it just hits itself back on the head every time in response to the perceived aggression of the last one, these sort of recriminating fights that it gets in by itself. So here you actually have a very uh, stable situation. You have um, this, uh, this tit for tat with imperfect knowledge. It's dealing mostly with always cooperates um, energy, average energy just goes up and up and up. Um, and you do have some continuation of these predatory always defects who are preying a lot of them on the always cooperate, but they they get beaten back some by this, um, by this tit for tat situation who's always gonna be defecting back against them. So these are kind of ecosystems that emerge from this model, um, ecosystems of different rules. And you know, even if by itself, um, tit for tat with imperfect knowledge tends to die out, uh, tit for tat with imperfect knowledge may thrive, as in here, um, in the context of other rules like uh, always cooperate. Um, and uh, tit for tat with uh, with imperfect knowledge can end up uh, doing very well put only with always cooperate, needless to say. And when it's put side by side with um, uh, with these um, uh, always defects by itself, um, uh, it will it will sort of push back against uh, the always defects, but. Here, what we're dealing with is elements of reciprocity, you know, uh, individual strategies, which, for example, repeat what was done to them. We're dealing with um, matters of uh, giving someone the benefit of the doubt initially, which is critical, it turns out, for tit for tat. We're dealing for issues of forgiveness, where um, if uh, uh, tit for tat with imperfect knowledge has a misunderstanding, it leads to this recriminating behavior with others of the same strategy, which can lead to a race to the bottom. Uh, and we can get these ecosystems developed where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, where you can get these uh, combinations of strategies that are stable, even if by themselves they're not stable. So this is um, an, interesting, uh, an interesting context to explore with reference to external behaviors in the world, world and the role that misunderstanding plays, forgiveness plays, issues of initial openness plays, um, uh, combinations of people, diverse combinations of people from different, um, uh, with different um, ways of dealing with each other um, can, can, can lead to dynamics quite different from what anyone strategy would suggest. So we're going to go on and uh, this is, um, we're going to finish up here, but I'm just going to, um, uh, to, to highlight that uh, in the opening time of our next session here on Thursday, we're going to take this to look at another central feature of the human sphere, a central um, element and, and component of people's interactions with each other um, and governor of those interactions, which is trust. And uh, I've listed here a set of um, you know, undeniable or, or minimally deniable central facts about trust, that it's relational, it's memoryful, depends on memory of, of, of past interactions. The fact that I trust you reflects how you've treated me in the past. Uh, it can change suddenly, like with a loss of trust, for example, or it can change on a continuous basis through slow interactions building up trust. Um, uh, it can be uh, transitive. If I uh, A trust B and B trust C, it can lead to A trusting C, for example. Um, 
And to a degree, if A trusts B, B is more likely uh, to trust A because they feel a certain openness. Um, yes, well, it, it comes into the networking side. That's right. And what we're going to be looking at is models that take the prisoner's dilemma sort of uh, arrangement and put it into an arrangement with trust, where some of these factors, some of these undeniable features of trust um, end up being built into the model as well. Um, and we have trust captured in the model in terms of memory. And we have prisoner's dilemma-like interactions taking place where each person can either um, treat the other person fairly or, or betray them or treat them unfairly. And we'll see that um, this can lead to um, quite, um, uh, quite intriguing behavior within, um, within uh, the context of interacting agents. But where it becomes really uh, uh, significant and, and worrisome in a way is how what it suggests with um, when groups of different types interact, particularly because of uh, this phenomenon known as outgroup group homogeneity, which is sometimes expressed as they all look the same to me. When people impute to people of another group. Um, certain shared characteristics, certain, um, and, and take their experience with one person of the group and believe it applies to all people with the group. Often negative experiences, they think, oh, all X are like that, and, um, and, and then factor that into the behavior. So this is one of, of three papers on trust that we've contributed, which build on, um, actually two that build on the prisoner's dilemma, a third that that deals with other issues. Um, but uh, we'll talk about this um, next time as we finish up our discussion of stylized models. So today, we've sought to use the lens of dynamic modeling and stylized models in particular um, to start to think about some of these aspects of the human condition, which um, may be hard to to, um, to find empirical direct empirical evidence on, but are so woven into our daily life that we barely think about it. Individual dyadic interactions, issues of, of building up uh, experience with individuals and reacting to friendly or perceived unfriendly behavior on their part. Next time we'll see how this relates to trust, okay? Um, so uh, that's all for today. I um, uh, hope that's uh, of interest, and I'd encourage people to try experimenting a bit with that, uh, some of that model, um, the, the prisoner's dilemma model, or some of the other models, because they can be um, fruitful for, for good thought. Thanks very much, and I will open office hours now.